Now, a different kind of ruler then arrived in Caesarea. One of the Herods, one of the last of the Herods that, we know, that we're told about in the book of Acts, King Agrippa. They arrive at Caesarea and they hear about Paul's case. And so uh, they decide, they decide that they want to hear Paul in person. Acts 25, 22, I would also like to hear the man myself. So Festus says to Agrippa, tomorrow you shall hear him. You come back tomorrow and we'll bring him in and you can hear everything that he has to say. So Agrippa comes with his wife, with great Roman pageantry, and so Festus introduces Agrippa and Paul to one another, and Paul makes his defense before King Agrippa. Now in chapter 26, just like chapter 22, Paul gives his testimony. And so the story he tells to King Agrippa is the same story that he told before the Jewish mob in Jerusalem. He tells the story in front of the Jewish mob in Jerusalem in chapter 22. He tells the story before the Gentile Roman ruler in chapter 26 in Caesarea. It's the same thing that we were told that was happening in Acts 9. But I will say this. There's one slight difference. You know, when Luke quotes someone, especially say when Luke reports a sermon, like the, the sermon of Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, or the sermon of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 just before he's killed, we should never think that every word is reported. We have a summary of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. But don't ever think that, that, um, that we're told every word. I mean, my goodness, in John chapter 6, when the Lord Jesus feeds the 5,000, He taught all day long. Can you imagine how many pages it would take to report what He said if He taught the entire day? So we're only giving a, given a, great, a brief summary. And amazingly, when Luke tells us about Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus in Acts 7, and when Paul shares his testimony in Acts 22, reporting what happened that day on the road to Damascus, we're not given a full quote of everything that Jesus said. But the last time Paul shares his testimony before King Agrippa in Acts 26, a new quote is given, an expanded quote is given, and we learn a fuller report of exactly what the Lord said on that day of Paul's conversion. And we see it in verse 14, Acts 26, verse 14. We had all fallen to the ground I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What are goads? Well, goads are what they used to keep an ox walking in the right direction. If the ox wanted to walk in the wrong direction, an ox is strong. If the ox doesn't want to go, you can't pull him in the right direction. No man is strong enough, but you can stick him with a goad and make him know that if he goes in that direction, it's, he's going to have pain. He's going to be hurt. So they use an ox goad to, um, to make him go in the right direction. There was a man called Shamgar in the Old Testament who fought a battle with, using an ox goad sharp like a sword, a stick with a sharp point. Well, now think about what's happening here. Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus, why are you persecuting me? What was he saying? 
when you have faithful Christians beaten, you're beating me. When you drag them away to prison, you're dragging me away to prison. When you kill Stephen, you're hurting me. Christ is our great head and our high priest. The head is in heaven, but the body is on earth. Therefore, the church is called the body of Christ. So when someone persecutes the church, when someone hurts Christians, they're also hurting Christ. That's an amazing thing. It's amazing that Christ allows Himself to be hurt. It's amazing that He allowed Himself to be persecuted and hurt during the days of His incarnation because He was the Son of God. But even after He dies, even after He's resurrected, even after He's ascended, even after He's enthroned in heaven, He still allows Himself to be hurt. Because when His body is persecuted, He is hurt. I don't know how many of you in here are parents yet. But when you become a mother, when you become a father, if you become a mother or a father, you will understand this. You will understand that there's no way for your child to be hurt without you being hurt. And in some ways, it hurts you worse than it hurts your child if your child is suffering. Now, we already knew that, though, from Acts 7 and Acts 22. We already knew that part of the quote. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing these bad things to me? Which helps to introduce the doctrine of the church as the body of Christ. But there's a new thing here. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. What does that mean? It means it's hurting you too. You may not realize it, but it's hurting you too. So here's an amazing new thought. When somebody is persecuting the church, when someone's persecuting Christ, when someone's fighting against God, they may not know it, but they're being hurt. Yesterday, I got an email from a young woman who's a missionary. And she was fired from her mission by her leader whom she believed to be persecuting her. And according to her, he not only fired her unfairly, but he then called everyone she knew to give his version of why he was right and why she was wrong. And she wrote to me crying out in desperation and, and in great pain and, and distress with a broken heart. And I wrote her back and I said, whatever you do, don't you try to contact those people and give them your version. Whatever you do, don't speak against him. If someone comes to you and says, did this happen? You can say, no, it didn't happen that way. You can do that if someone comes to you. But you don't, you don't do what he did. You don't go and try to talk to everybody and give them your version about how you're good and he's bad. That's what he did. He tried to tell everybody he was good and you're bad, and what he did was justified. Don't do what he did. What you need to do is you need to pray for mercy for him because God is going to deal with him, and it's not going to be pleasant. So in Acts chapter 26, we have this amazing new thought which is introduced by the fuller quote from what the Lord said on the road from the sky above the road to Damascus to Saul of Tarsus. This new thought, Saul, you're not only hurting me, you're hurting yourself. It doesn't do the ox any good to kick against the goads. It only hurts the ox. It doesn't do him any good. 
So we have the great testimony again. And uh, we have a little bit fuller um, expression of what the way Paul viewed his ministry that um, Christ in verse 16 promises that he will appear to him, that he will deliver him from the Jews and from the Gentiles who will both oppose him. Look at verse 18. This is a picture of New Testament ministry. To open their eyes, this is a change of nature. If someone is blind and then they can see, that's a change of nature. They were a fly, now they're a bee. They were an unbeliever, now they're a believer. They were a hater of Jesus, now they're a worshiper of Jesus. They were a hater of Gentiles, now they are a lover of Gentiles. They were blind, now they can see. To open their eyes, Acts 26, 18, that they may turn from darkness of light to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. I don't know if Bob Dylan is saved or not, but he went through um, a period where he professed to a Christian conversion. When he did that, he made two Christian albums. The most famous song on one of the albums, and by the way, he can't sing anymore. He's 69 years old. He keeps touring. He keeps making new records. He keeps singing. He lost his voice. My wife has always hated his voice. Even when he was young, she had, said he had a terrible voice. I love his voice when he was younger. My wife hated it. So it, he never had a classically beautiful voice. But I love his voice in his 20s and 30s. His voice is gone. It's awful. But when he made this album, this Christian album, the most famous song on it said, uh, you got to serve somebody. You see, there is no neutrality in the spiritual world. Jesus says, the one who's not with me is against me. You can't say, I, I don't believe anything. In Germany, when you register for your taxes, you can say you are uh, Catholic, you're Roman Catholic, you are Evangelisch, you are Protestant, or no confession, no confession. And there are those who are secular and there are those who are atheistic who say they have no confession. They say they don't believe anything. It doesn't work that way. Not to decide is to decide. If you're not for the light, you're for the darkness. Even though you may not admit it, even though you may not be conscious of it, even though you may not want to think about it, even though you deny it and dispute it, if you don't serve God, you are serving somebody, and the somebody you're serving is not nice. Paul says to, to, to turn them from the dominion of Satan to God. You're either in the dominion of Satan or you're under the dominion of God. There is no neutral ground in the spiritual universe. Every cubic centimeter of space in the universe is disputed. There's a war going on over that space, and you're either on one side or the other, whether you admit it or not. We're in the midst of the trial. It's three trials in a row by these Roman judges. This judge is actually a king, King Agrippa. In Acts 26, Paul has given his um, testimony again. He's, he has summarized his ministry in verse 18, Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. So first of all, so that they might change what they see and whether they can see. Secondly, that they might change whom they serve. Thirdly, that they might change their status from being sinners to be forgiven in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and fourth, that they might receive Christ's own reward, that they might receive an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, that is, faith in Christ. Um, sanctification is a, is, a, is a move toward holiness. 
It's a move from defilement to, to righteousness. It's a move from um, being dirty to being clean. And if I adopt a child, I cannot give him my nature. I can only give him my name. I can't give him my DNA. I can only give him my money. Um, I can't give him an IQ, but I can pay for his university. I have friends who adopted a Korean child, and then they had their own children. Well, obviously, that Korean child looks very, very different from the other children. That child has the same name. That child has the same legal rights. That child has the same inheritance. But that child does not have the same nature. That child is not the same flesh and blood. Well, you know what? God does both. Because when we are saved, we, we are justified by faith. That is, we are declared to be legally clear by judicial decision. That's justification. Although we are practically guilty, legally we are declared righteousness in Christ because Christ has paid the penalty for us. But God doesn't stop there. He doesn't simply forgive our sins, give us a new status, bring us into His family by adoption, but there's something else that happens. It's called regeneration. We're given a new birth. And in that new birth, we receive a new nature. And it's Christ's own nature. So that we actually become a child of God. Not just legally, but spiritually. And by grace, we grow toward conformity to the character and attributes of God's own Son, Jesus. That growth is called sanctification. And so in verse 18, Paul talks about some of the benefits that Christian ministry brings to people who are coming to know Christ. They have their eyes open. They turn from darkness. They start serving God. They stop serving Satan. They receive forgiveness of sins. They received an inheritance, and through faith in Jesus, they also receive the growing reality of practical holiness. When we become a Christian, our destiny is different. We're not bound for darkness anymore. We're not bound for hell anymore. We're bound for heaven. But also, our deeds become different. We stop acting like children of hell, and we begin to act like children of heaven. Does that mean we become perfect? Goodness, no. We stumble, we go backwards, we mess up, but we have a Savior, and we go to Him, and we get not only forgiveness and pardon, but we, give, we get power. We not only get pardon for the fact that we've lived an old, bad life, but we get power to live a new, better life. That's what it means to be sanctified by faith in Christ. And so, Paul, amazingly, packs all this theology into his testimony before this lost Roman king, a, a child of Herod. He says in verse 19, I got this vision and I wasn't disobedient to it, but I kept declaring to everyone in Damascus and Jerusalem and Judea and even to the Gentiles, this is an echo of what he says in, Ath in Athens in Acts 17.30, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate with repentance. How do you know somebody's really repented? Because they say it? No. Because they perform deeds which are consistent with repentance. If we have a new nature, it will show itself. If our nature is unchanged, that will also show itself. For this reason, he says in verse 21, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. But I obtained help from God, and this day I stand before you testifying. 
the small and great, that nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. You see, this is what he's saying. Christ doesn't destroy the law. Christ fulfills the law. The law and prophets pointed to Christ. That Christ was to suffer, and by reason of His resurrection from the dead, He always gets that in there. He always gets that in there. His resurrection from the dead. His resurrection from the dead. You see, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then the worst that the writer of the Ecclesiastes feared takes place. It doesn't matter. The religious man, the atheist, they're thrown into the same grave. The philosopher, the fool, they're thrown into the same grave. The rich man, the poor man, they're thrown into the same grave. Everybody dies. Everything is forgotten. What difference does it make? Well, if our life is only lived under this sun, it doesn't make any difference. But if this life is only the beginning, only the introduction to another life which never ends, then everything makes a big difference. And the thing that proves that there will be a difference is the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the first, first fruit of those who die the first fruits from the dead. Now, they're listening to this, and I think maybe Festus is a little bit concerned that he got King Agrippa into all this, and he's a little bit embarrassed because now Paul is really preaching. You know, Paul isn't just telling this, them what happened in Jerusalem. This is how I got arrested. This is what you guys need to decide. These are the charges against me. This is my defense of those charges. He goes way beyond the legal and historical narrative. And he says, you know what? This isn't just something between me and my Jewish accusers. This is something between you and God. You not only have to decide about my guilt legally, you got to decide about your guilt spiritually. You are the judge in my legal case, yes, but you yourselves have been judged by the righteous judge, the judge of all judges, who is God. And now that you know the truth, you're held accountable. Well, you know, he, he starts to preach. And when he starts to preach, you know, Festus, he's, he kind of he cries out and he kind of puts a stop to the sermon and he says, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning has driven you mad. Now, there's something very significant there. When Festus says to Paul, your great learning, I think he's telling us something. I think he's telling us that he realizes that this prisoner in front of him is not an, or an ordinary person pickpocket or murderer. This man is a genius. This man has great, great learning. And I think one thing Festus realizes is that this guy's a lot smarter than we are, but he can't quite bring himself to believe in the miracles. And when Paul begins to talk about the resurrection of the dead, and when Paul begins to apply the message to them, Festus said, you know what, Paul? You've learned a lot, but it may have tipped you over the edge, all that great learning. You know, you spent all that time in the library, drove you a little nutty. And that's what I'm afraid has happened. Paul says in verse 25, I'm not out of my mind. Most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. People who are crazy are not sober. Their words are not measured. Their words are not under control. The king, meaning the man sitting next to you, King Agrippa, he knows about these matters. He knows what I'm talking about. He's noticed that these things, these gospel events, these things which happened with Jesus, these things which have happened to me, 
they didn't take place in private. They took place out in the open. So he knows that what I'm saying is faithful to the truth. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets, he said? I know that you do. And then King Agrippa says this, in a short time, Paul, you will persuade me to become a Christian. And you see what you see what's happening. Paul is making the personal appeal. And you know, when you and I witness, this is why we can't just drop off a tract or give somebody a testament. We need to make the personal appeal. We need to say, do you believe this? And we need to say, you need to become a Christian now. You need to trust Christ now. We don't have any promise of tomorrow. Today is the only possibility we have to trust God because yesterday's gone and tomorrow never comes. Every day is always today. So today's the only day we can be sure of. And Paul presses home the case personally. And, you know, Luke is faithful to report that Paul's preaching really got to these guys. Festus was convicted. He was convicted of sin in chapter 24. He knew it was true, but he ran away. He was so scared. He thought, you know, I don't have to talk to this guy. I'm the boss and he's the prisoner. And for two years, he stayed away from him. And Paul presses the point home to King Agrippa in Festus' presence. In these amazing words, one of the most important verses in the book of Acts, Acts 26, 28, Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. Ooh, if it could only be true. You know, um, that verse fills us with great hope. And that verse fills us with great sadness. What that means is that he knew that it was true. I've met so many people who knew that it was true, who admitted that it was true. And yet they, they would never make a commitment and give their hearts to Christ. Do you realize, I think we must have talked about this in our study of John, that all of the final miracles that Jesus worked, he worked for unbelievers. In the upper room, he said, one of you will betray me. When he said that, he was working a miracle because he was reading someone's mind. But there was only one person in the room who knew that he was reading somebody's mind. And that was the person whose mind he was reading. And that person was the one unbeliever in the room. It was Judas. He was working a final miracle for Judas. He was proving to Judas that he was omniscient, that he was the Son of God, that he knew everything. Did Judas repent? No. No. He carried out the plan. There was something more important to him than the truth. It's the truth that sets us free. The devil's motive is murder. He wants to kill you. His methodology is deception. His goal is death. His method is lying. He kills by convincing people of lies. And there are so many people that they realize it's a lie, but they, they follow the lie anyway. Adam was not deceived by the serpent. 1 Timothy chapter 2. But he ate the fruit anyway. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. 
God is saving people in high places. Yesterday I talked to a man who'd been in China. We're thinking about China in America because the president of China just arrived in America yesterday to meet with our president. And this person who just returned from China told me yesterday that, there, that uh, Christianity is approaching 10% in China. You know what that means? If 10% of Christians, if 10% of the Chinese people are Christians, that means that there are as many Christians in China as there are Russians. And um, I don't know if that's true or not. It may be exaggerating. That, that might be too optimistic. But the same person told me that there are many high government officials who have become Christian. Now, this is a high government official, and he knows that it's true. I said that the final miracles were for unbelievers. The last miracle Jesus worked on the way to the cross was he reattached the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant, after Peter cut it off. Remember? Probably that was the most pain that Malchus had ever felt up to that moment. I don't know if you've ever really been cut. I don't know if you've ever broken a bone. I broke my ankle playing football in 1963. It was the most pain I had ever felt in my life up to that moment. I'm sure that was the most pain Malchus had ever felt. This crazy Jew cut my ear off. And just like that, the pain was gone. Just like that. Not only was the pain gone, but because Jesus healed him, just like that, it felt good. Who did Jesus do that for? He did it for a man who'd come to drag him away to death. It was the guards who saw the resurrection, or they saw something that made them faint. We don't know exactly what they did saw, but see, but whatever it was, they fainted when they saw it. They received the proof of the miracle of the resurrection, and the chief priest received the reports of the resurrection from the eyewitnesses. Were the guards converted? No. Were the priests converted? No. They knew it was true, but they chose to serve a lie instead of the truth. You are so young that you probably don't realize how fallen we are as human beings. When we get saved, we receive this new power, this new set of desires, but we still have this old nature as long as we live in these bodies. I've been a Christian nearly 40 years, and yet almost daily I feel the power of my old nature. I feel the power of sin. I feel the power of Adam asserting itself within me, dragging me down, the gravity of sin inclining me in the wrong direction. I'm a Christian. I've been born again. i got the Holy Spirit living in my heart. Think about a human creature who's not born again, who doesn't have Christ, who doesn't have the, as a Savior and the Holy Spirit as a helper, enthroned. Think how powerful the inclination to sin is and how irresistible it is. Even when they recognize the truth, they turn away from it. Agrippa knew the truth. And he said, you know what? You're almost leading me to Christ. Well, why not, man? One day you're going to be dead. Then what? How long do you think you're going to be a king? How long do you think you're going to be dead? While we are alive, the gospel is the most important thing, though we may not know it. When we die, the gospel will be the only thing, and we will know it for sure and forever.
you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul says beautifully in verse 29, I wish to God, we say that in English, we usually say it profanely, in a bad way, to misuse God's name. Paul says it worshipfully, reverently. I wish to God you were a Christian. I wish to God I could persuade you to become a Christian. Whether If it takes a short time or if it takes a long time, not only you, but everybody who hears me, I wish you all were like me except not in these chains. I want you to be a prisoner of Christ, but not a prisoner of Rome. So the king gets up, and the governor gets up, and the king's wife gets up. Those who were with him, they got up, and they walked away. And they said, you know what? He's not guilty. And Agrippa said, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, we would have let him go. And that's one of the great ironies, isn't it? But we don't need to second guess God. We don't need to second guess what happened. We don't need to second guess the continuation of Paul's imprisonment. We don't need to second guess the way Paul died. We don't need to second guess what happened next. God is sovereign. And Paul was God's man. He was Christ's man. He was doing exactly what he was supposed to do. We have a saying in English, what comes after if ain't. You get that? What comes after if is not. Agrippa says, if, if he had not appealed to Caesar, we could let him go. But he did appeal to Caesar. And they didn't let him go. They send him to Rome. They send him to Rome on a boat. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.